Hello, and welcome to Tuneful Talk. This is Louisa and Candice. This podcast is devoted to discussing topics relevant to both music educators and music therapists. For more resources and podcasts, please visit our website, tunefultalk.weebly.com. Hope you enjoy. Welcome back, and we're happy to have with us our first guest speaker on our podcast. Um, We have Michael Crawford. Now, Michael is a Ph.D. student with me right now at University of North Texas. His primary research interests include ethnomusicology, world music pedagogy, and music educator preparation. Michael received his undergraduate degree in music education and a master's in percussion performance. He has spent 12 years as an assistant band director and was an adjunct lecturer uh, of percussion at Tarleton State University and Baylor University. And actually unknown to both of us until a little later is that that's where Michael and I first met was I was at Baylor at the same time that he was working on my undergraduate. And so when we met again at UNT, we were like, you look familiar, you know, the small world of music education. (laughs) (laughs) So Michael's also a Pearl Drums Regional Marching Percussion Artist and Certified Smithsonian Folkways World Music Pedagogy Educator. So welcome, Michael. That's a mouthful. (laughs) It is. (laughs) Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me, of course. Jump in, Louisa. Yeah. Okay, so I think our first question is about world music, because I know Candace told me that you've described it as world musics with an S, and we were just a little curious as to why, and if you can give us some background on that. Sure, absolutely. You know, um, this is something that is very diverse in its representation, which I know is why you bring it up, because it's confusing at times. Do I use the S at the end? Do I refer to it as world music? What does that mean? What does the plural term mean? Is that something different? And for me personally, I think a lot of people share the vision that the S is much more inclusionary. It it encompasses all music from the world and it makes it, it gives it a point of emphasis where it's not describing a singular music, but it encompasses all world music, including our, you know, what we're used to, Western classical music as well. I think that's great because we were talking about when we started this series of music from cultures around the world, uh, you see the term world music, you see the term ethnic music, you see world musics in the plural form. And so it can get confusing sometimes as Mm -hmm. to what exactly people mean with all these different terms. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's just, it's fair to add that S on the end. That way, when you're talking to your students, they understand that, okay, we're talking about more than just one. We're talking about more than just one type of music. We're talking about musics. Part of the current disconnect and uh, frustrations with the term world music or even world musics is it has a bit of a shady past in the uh, pop genre, believe it or not. And around the early 1960s, the uh, pop industry started to market anything that sounded exotic or any kind of music that recorded by professional recording artists that had a different instrumentation or a different feel or a different style. They started to market that as a world beat or new age world music. And, and there was a lot of that going on. Um, Ravi Shankar was playing sitar with the Beatles Miles Davis and John Coltrane had a ton of Eastern influence in their their new era of jazz that had you know come out of the 50s, this cool jazz and bop and stuff like that. And, and what happens is the record industry jumped on that opportunity and kind of created this categorical music term called world music. And world music was used uh, to essentialize and make something exotic, you know, This is something that you would never get unless you buy the record. Um, And people, understandably and deservingly so, people were really upset that other cultures' instruments and other cultures' music was being um, hijacked and really exploited to make money and to sell records. I know personally, I grew up in the early mid-90s. I remember experiencing that. Uh, There's a band called Enigma, and Enigma was this kind of club techno group but they would often 
take like Native American chant and layer it over the top of their techno music. And I just remember as a kid going, wow, that's really so different. But the problem was, is I wasn't appreciating the Native American music for its cultural origins. I was just appreciating it because it was so exotic and othering. And that abuse has really led to a, a lot of negative associations with the term world music. So I think soon, uh, and certainly there are going to be a lot of people moving away from that term because it's just been wrapped in so many negative things. Mm-hmm. Have you heard of a term that might replace world music? You know, multicultural music and multicultural music education has come up a lot, you know, using the term diversity, mm-hmm. using the term music and not trying to delineate any kind of other association with it yeah. is what, and to be honest, is what I try to push forward. And I just say, hey, we're going to do a new to us type of music. Mm-hmm. And then maybe that's South Indian music. But I don't, I try not to make this clear delineation that it's separate from ours. It's just different. I like that. I think that's great, Michael. So when introducing music from another culture that perhaps our students or ourselves we are not as familiar with, what do you think are some things musicians should keep in mind as we do that? Yeah, that's a big one. And something I want to come back to is a technique called world music pedagogy, which is becoming very, very popular, which has connected itself to the Smithsonian Folkways. I know so a lot of your listeners are probably familiar with the Folkways website. This is a um, a loyal group of followers who have taken that Smithsonian Folkways website and then provided a a tangible process of going through those lessons and how to introduce them to your students. So the first thing I would highly recommend, again, is using language to describe other cultures' music that you would also use to describe our culture's music. So pretty, fun, you know, exciting as opposed to music that would other it and essentialize it, such as exotic or this is neat or this is you know way different and cool, just language and discussions that will help help the students understand that this is equal to our music. It's just it's just different. You know they use different instruments, they use different language, not that it's um, exotic. But world music pedagogy. Their primary concern and their primary objective is with the role of music within the culture of origin itself. And the key word there being culture. And that's uh, listening and cultural awareness are at the absolute core of world music pedagogy because they think that um, this leads to the recognition of the beauty of the culture and the diversity within that culture. And it underscores the logic. Music is also being an oral art form and not just a technical art form, meaning the processes in which we engage in music doesn't have to be the same every time. It's okay to learn by road. It's okay to learn by ear. It's okay to learn by call and response. Mm -hmm. We don't have to learn the scale first and then learn the fingerings and then learn the form and then learn the note names. You know, we can actually start with the music first. Mm-hmm. Sound before symbol. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That That's right. That's a great connection. What I like most about the world music pedagogy is that the there are five phases, attentive listening, engaged listening, inactive listening, inactive with the E, creating and integrating. And the first three of those five all have to do with listening. So attentive listening is literally the teacher just directing a listening experience. So I want to I want to play some music from South Africa. I put it on my, you know, my computer, put it over the speakers, and I just let the kids and the students absorb it and experience it before we make any judgment about who it is or where it is. And then the second one goes a little bit deeper. They call it engaged listening, where maybe you have the entire class tap their hand to the beat of the music. Same music. Inactive listening is trying to extract a little musical element. So if there's a a cyclical rhythm, you can maybe have the class try to perform that and, and kind of 
get closer, get a little bit more intimate with the listening. Uh, the fourth one being creating, which is a way of maybe reinventing and, and improvising in the style of that music. So creating your own piece, your own rhythms in the style of that piece of music you're listening to. And finally, the last one is integrating, which is a connection to food and dress, spiritual practices, politics, uh, common traditions of that culture. Again, listening and culture always being the, the centerpiece to the whole process. Very neat. So as you were saying those different things, I was thinking music therapy things oh, yeah. <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. So there are four methods of how we practice music therapy. And it's receptive, where it's, you know, listening, mm. compositional, recreative, and then improvisation. And some of the things you were talking about, you know, they fit within those four categories or within kind of both of them, especially when you're talking about like recreative and improvisation. Yeah. So, And I, I'm, I'm guessing, I, I don't know, but I'm guessing that that continuum of four is, doesn't have to go one, two, three, four. No. It can go two, four, one. Yeah. Same thing with the world music pedagogy. If you want to start with integrating, you know, you introduce the whole lesson cycle with, you know, talking about food and you know, showing the flag and talking about the population of the country. And absolutely. Yeah. And for these four methods, we choose whichever fits for the client and whatever they need. Mm -hmm. So maybe they need to work on just listening and receiving some sort of music, or maybe it's more of they need to create, Yeah, which might be the more improvisational part of it. So, and I think maybe a student just needs and wants and responds best when you play to them Mm -hmm. you know you're presenting music to them or maybe that they find the most enjoyment when they're participating so to have the the skill sets and the knowledge of your own student and those processes are are key for sure so michael with your studies in ethnomusicology and world music pedagogy what is it that drew you to your interest in all these different types of music? Oh, yeah. Oh, great question. I, my upbringing is very traditional. I, I grew up in Texas and I started band in sixth grade and I wanted to play the saxophone, but I got, I think I got to the band fair late and they had me audition for percussion because they were already full and it just stuck and I, I loved it. A lot of my friends were playing. Well, I wanted to play the drums, to be, <laughs> let's just be honest. I didn't want to play percussion. I wanted to play drums. But uh, I fell in love with that and uh, got into percussion heavily and knew about my sophomore year in high school that this was a path that people would pay me money one day to teach drums. And I thought that was the greatest thing ever. And I, I had a lot of great exposure to West African drumming. I got to play steel pans when I was in high school. So I had a lot of early expo- and really positive experiences participating in world music ensembles. And in, in hi- this is a hindsight perspective, but I remember those ensembles being so fundamentally different, musically speaking. It, it was so refreshing and it really energized me in a different way. And I, and I love marching band. I love participating in all region and concert band and but the steel drum ensemble was so different. You know, it, it awoke it awoke something inside of me that that marching band couldn't or didn't. And again, I just I fell in love with the process of participating in those ensembles, mm-hmm. and really started to study it and seek. Um, and re- and much like everybody, my undergrad education did not prepare me to or expose me to a lot of world music ensembles because. I went to a small liberal arts college and we just didn't have that kind of thing. So a lot of workshops, a lot of driving to South Carolina to take a lesson with someone, you know, and just reaching out as as much as I can independently. Mm -hmm. I know you talked about your performance. And I remember in one of our classes that we had together, we discussed how, you know, some people went to a steel pan concert and they encourage dancing and moving for the concert goers Mm -hmm. and how that was a very refreshing experience as a concert goer because you're able to move to the music rather than the typical what we're used to and what maybe even where we teach our kids is to sit quietly and listen rather than be active and part of the music. 
Yeah, and you just articulated really, really well uh, what a man named Thomas Torino defines as participatory versus presentational music. Mm -hmm. And I say we, uh, probably most of the listeners and the three of us here, we are most accustomed to the presentational style of, you know, traditional choir or orchestra or band where we work for weeks or months on music. The audience comes and sits down, we play it, and at the very end, they clap to show their appreciation. Mm -hmm. That is a very presentational style. It has these unspoken rules that you have to follow. But what you mentioned about the people you knew that had these experiences with uh, world music ensembles, is it's a participatory performance. There is no structured focus on technique or standardized repertoire, typically. There is no audience artist delineation, Mm -hmm. as in this is an event where we're all going to share this music. And if you want to uh, participate in it as well by dancing or clapping or ulating or whatever you can do, then that is certainly welcome. And that's a that's a very different experience. Mm -hmm. It's more active. You mentioned uh, your experience in being in some ensembles like that. Do you have a favorite memory or something you'd like that comes to mind? No, well, one one of the stories I always tell is um, one of my first experiences is when I was pursuing my master's degree. And for frame of reference, I got my undergraduate in music education. I was pursuing my master's degree in percussion performance. So at this juncture, I, I had a bit of confidence that I was a good percussionist. You know, <laughs> I I had, I had made it to a, a pretty high level at that juncture, and we had a guest clinician bring some West African A-way drumming. And we can talk about A-way drumming later on in the podcast and more specifics, but from an individual perspective, I mean, what, what, what an individual is playing on a drum or a bell or a shake ray is really quite simple. I mean, you may be only playing <laughs> over and over and over and over, but the complexity is when the layers and layers and layers of polyrhythms add on top. And I had an unhealthy amount of confidence and volunteered to go up and I fell flat on my face. I could not, (laughs) I could not sustain my rhythm with all of the, you know, the complexities of those interlocking patterns. It was so um, illuminating and humiliating and exciting all at the same time. You know, it just, it made me want to learn more and it made me want to uh, experience what was so fundamentally different about that in in all the best ways. Hmm. All right. Well, this is going to be kind of a long episode, so let's take a quick break. All right. Welcome back, everyone. So, Michael, in this episode, we're specifically talking about some music from the African continent. And I know that that is music from that region of the world is something that you're really passionate about. Can you tell us a little bit of specifics there? Yes, absolutely. Ironically, this discussion should begin with, if not for COVID-19, I would be in Africa right now or on a plane uh, to Paris and then uh, Senegal, Africa. But that trip got canceled. So So the next best thing is to talk with us about it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so, so instead of flying to Paris and uh, Dakar, Senegal, I am, I'm with you guys, which is the second best option. Yay. We appreciate it. You know, something very important in the pedagogy of world music is always understanding your positionality. And I, I am not African by any stretch of the imagination. And because of the cancellation of this trip, I I don't have any firsthand direct immersion in those cultures. So all that I share with my students are either through my research or through my experiences with people that we call uh, culture bearers. And there are people who bear the culture from this area. And most of my affiliations have been with people from West Africa and the music that, that comes from there. So we're talking Ghana, uh, Guinea, Liberia, Nigeria, Senegal, all part of the West African musical traditions. And uh, to break the continent down a little bit 
and this is a gross overgeneralization, but uh, there, there are two primary cultural zones. There's the Pan-Arabic, which is predominantly what we would think of as um, Egypt and Tunisia, that North African area. And then there is Sub-Saharan Africa. To put it in perspective, we're talking about 3,000 separate ethnic groups. And beyond that, you know, independent cultures within those ethnic groups. So uh, there's a lot going on. And anyone who is a scholar of African tradition or music will be quick to slap your hand and say, you can't just use the term Africa. You know, you have to be, you have to be more specific about region and society groups and ethnic groups and things like that. So I say that mainly for myself as I go through this process. But um, some general African music principles that are more common than not in, the, in that region is that music, by and large, is an oral tradition, uh, which is very different than what we're used to. We have folk melodies, you know, Happy Birthday and, and Johnny Appleseed and things like that that we pass down orally. But our music education from a very early age, where we learn, you know, solfege or note names, that is not as common in the African content. They typically focus on music making groups in Africa versus individuals, where particularly in the secondary schools here in America and across Europe, we focus on the individual, the strength of the individual. So therefore the result of the group is better. Africans tend to think in reverse. We get the strength of the group good and solid. And that's, that's ultimately what we want. And of course, there's an extremely close relationship between African music and dance and African music and language, which to be honest is part of why the A-way music was hard for me to learn because I don't understand the language and a lot of it, the way it's taught orally speaking is they speak the language and that's the way you dictate the rhythm on the drum or the bell. And I was just <laughs> completely in the dark. And we talked a little bit about that Ghanaian, the, the complexity of the polyrhythmic you know, the beauty and the challenge and the unique qualities of West African drumming and are the complex polyphonic and the complex polyrhythmic textures. So West African music is thought to be, and is most celebrated from a vertical perspective as opposed to a horizontal linear perspective. You know, I, I think of Western classical music, which I love and I'm very well versed. We think it has a little intro theme and then we have the a section then we have a development and then we go to the b section then we have a development and you know kind of like a rondo form or something we think of it moving from left to right uh, whereas african music is thought to go from bottom to top the linear progression is not the most important thing it's the way that all the interactions rhythmically top to bottom happen together thank you for explaining that because when you first said vertical and horizontal i was like Wait, what? <laughs> but I can see that being really neat in a classroom or in the group of setting up the foundation and then each getting to build on each other. Whether you're doing it in the form of representing African music or you're just improvising. Yeah, whenever you were talking about it, I had the visual of filling up a glass. What was the visual that came to mind? Mm. I, you know, one of the beautiful things about using uh, West African drumming patterns and music stylings in your class, uh, whether it be, you know, K through five, or you're dealing with adults, or you're dealing with music therapy clients, is that fundamentally, it's quite simple in its execution. And the participatory style doesn't put too much credit into the technique and the appropriate way that you're holding the instrument. It's about the experience that you're having. So the young students aren't governed by judgment and they're not reluctant. They, you know, particularly there's drums around. And as long as the teacher is presenting it without judgment, they're willing to do anything. And it's all, you know, call and response. It's all just showing by example you hit the drum four times, right, left, right, left, and then your students will naturally do that without question. You know, it's it's really great in the classroom environment. Yes, and I've seen this in action with Michael in uh, 
presentations at Texas Music Educators Conference, and it's been great, and even my own class, because sometimes when you're working with adults versus kids, particularly adults that may not have a musical background, they can have some hesitancy. So what advice would you give to somebody leading this activity and encountering either a group or a few individuals that are hesitant to take part in this participatory activity? Yeah, I think that's a really great observation. And this is something I've been doing these types of clinics and presentations for about five, six years now. And I've learned a lot about myself and a lot about the process of what works really well. And to be honest, what I had to pull away from is that I have a master's degree in percussion performance. So the first thing I want to do is I want to make sure that everybody is holding the drum correctly and striking the drum correctly. But that was a really detrimental mindset. And I found myself at the end of the hour session having not accomplished as much as I want. So I really flipped that pyramid upside down and started with simple conversational rhythms that I knew that everyone, even without musical training, could do. You know, don't, 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 don't. And they play that back to you. I play, you play, I play, you play. And two things. The first thing we're doing, we're engaging in music instantaneously without any uh, qualifications. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is we're systematically building confidence. And those people who were intimidated are not like, hey, look what I did. You know, I just played a rhythm <laughs> with other people. It was amazing. Let's put on a concert. You know, they uh, understand, but they, they get really excited and they get really um, invested and intrigued. And uh, like Luisa was using this term earlier, you just slowly fill that cup of water up slowly and slowly and incrementally. They don't even know what's happening. And by the end of that 45 minute hour session, we're making really cool music together. And it's just because you opened up their vulnerability and their willingness to want to be a part of it. I think really what you shared is what every elementary teacher needs to take to heart, that you don't have to have the perfect technique to bring this into your classroom, to have your students start experiencing it. So many teachers hold back because we feel like there's so much in music and we can't be experts in, in all. Yeah, yeah. And I represent everything that is presentational music. I mean, I that's that's who I am. That's where I came from. And there are great benefits to that. And there are good things that can be accomplished. But there are equal amount of good things for that participatory style of engagement to where you rip away all the judgment and the the shyness and the vulnerability. And you just say like, hey... It doesn't even matter what you sound like. What's most important to me is that we're here together making music. And that can be really refreshing to both the teacher and the student, of course. That's great. Real quick, before we let you go, I know we are planning to have a handout that goes with this podcast. And on that handout, you mentioned transmission. Mm. Can you briefly tell us about transmission? Yeah. When you're introducing another culture's music, it's the fault we talked about, like you're introducing a piece from Guatemala and it's in Spanish and that's really confusing to you. So you just translate it to English and then you're Kodai train. So you teach it ta, ta, ti, ti, ta. And basically uh, it's the concept of you have a car. If you remove the hubcap, is it still a car? Yes. If you take off one of the windshield wipers, is it still a car? Yes. If you remove three of the four tires, is it still a car? Uh, you know, what? what is that tipping point where you've you've taken so many elements out of the music that it's not really Guatemalan music anymore? It's this weird hybrid th Frankenstein that you created. I infer that the, the way that you teach the music is equally important to the music itself. So if I'm teaching West African music, I'm not going to write it out. I'm not going to give it to my kids in eighth notes and sixteenth notes. I'm going to teach it in that oral tradition. I'm going to use the native Ghanaian language the best I can. You know, we're going to go through the process in the most appropriate cultural way because it's an experience. It's not just a novel thing. Like, let's do something different. No, let's, let's experience West African music. Yeah. 
Well, Michael, it has been so great having you as our guest on Tuneful Talk because that is what our goal is, to just encourage this dialogue between all different areas of music education and music therapy so that we can help inform each other. And I just love our discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for having me, and I hope I was able to help. Well, listeners, I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as we did. This has been our longest episode yet, Mm -hmm. and we'd like to thank you for sticking with us. So we are going to wrap up by sharing a few songs with you, and these songs we have used with our own students. In fact, this first song we're going to share is one that our choirs performed together in a joint elementary concert whenever Louisa and I were teaching in public schools. Yep, fun times. So this one is called Jumbo Buana, and it is a greeting song. And it was actually written in 1982 by a band from Kenya called Them Mushrooms. This song was written by the band because they heard tourists, whenever they came to the hotel, trying to speak Swahili. And they were trying to practice different phrases. So they created this song for travelers to hear, so that way they learned those kind of introductory phrases such as hi how are you and of course you'll recognize a very famous line which is akuna matata so i'm going to translate a few of the lines that i'm about to say the first one is jambo buana hi sir habari gani how are you misuri sana very fine wageni wakari bishwa which is visitors are welcome kenya yetu And this is our country, Kenya. And this can change depending on what country that they are singing it in. Uh, And then our last one, of course, is Akuna Matata, which is there are no worries or no worries. And it sounds like this. Jumbo, Jumbo Buana, Aparigani, Misuri Sana, Wakeni, Wakari Bishwa. Kenya yetu, akuna matata. And that's the song. Very catchy for the kids. That was so much fun to do. Mm-hmm. Okay. Next, I believe, is your turn, Candice. All right, my turn. Um, so this song I'm going to share with you is from Ghana. And it's traditionally done with a circle game where you pass rocks. And it's called Obitsana. There's many variations of it, but this is the version that I use. Obitsana sa na na, obitsana sa. Obitsana sa na na, obitsana sa. And it has a little chorus that goes. Obitsana, obitsana sa. Obitsana, obitsana sa. And the translation for this song is, The rock has crushed my hand, Grandma. Or if you want to be a little bit nicer, I just hit my fingers on the rock. (laughs) And so we have a few resources on our website if you want to learn how to play the game. Like I said, it's, it's traditionally done with rocks, but I often played this game in my classroom with rhythm sticks. And I've seen it done with bean bags. I think when I was student teaching, my student teacher did bean bags. I've also done uh, finger puppets. I had a class set of finger puppets, and that day we were singing different passing songs and different kind of movement songs, so we did it with our finger puppets. That's so cute. They enjoyed it. <laughs> I think in a pinch, I even played it one time with um, the students just each took a piece of paper and crumpled it up. <laughs> <laughs> to make a rock. <laughs> yeah, that works. I love the idea of also using this just for transitions in your classroom. Yeah. Because the passing game, you can use it to pass out items to your class or mm-hmm. to collect them as well. Yeah, yeah. All of them are good. All right, so now it's my turn. <laughs> and this song is called Funga Alafia, and it is a hello and welcome song. So Funga translates to the word for drum. Alafia is welcome and ashe is amen or so be it. And later on I'll post a video because in a a class I took last semester our percussion teacher showed us a pretty simple drumming pattern we could do with this song to accompany ourselves and maybe to accompany our kids singing it. I'll I'll share that with y'all. I'm going to do it on djembe. This song sounds like this. Funga lafia, 
Ashe, Ashe, Banga la fia, Ashe, 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 Ashe. That's great. And that song comes from Nigeria, right, Louisa? Yes, yes, I forgot to mention that. <laughs> This next song comes from the Eastern Cape of Africa, Mm -hmm. which is the Providence of South Africa. And I have searched and tried to find out more about this song, but like we've talked before, you just kind of have to be honest about your shortcomings. Mm -hmm. And so other than where it's from and a little bit of translation, I have not been able to find out any, any other information about this song. So listeners, if you know more, please contact us and let us know on our website. Mm -hmm. So this song is called Throw, Catch, and it goes, Throw, catch, throw, catch, throw, catch, Chikeleza, throw, catch, throw, catch, throw, catch, Chikeleza, na 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 Chikeleza, throw, catch. And so I love using this song for movement. You can have the students uh, toss a small item or it might be a little safer to have them pretend to toss it during the throw catch part. And then Gkeleza means to turn around. And so I love doing movement, adding in a stomp, adding in some improvisation at the na 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 part. And you're welcome to repeat that as many times as you like because you can just have the students start to add in desk cants and just really have fun and be creative with it. Mm-hmm. And I've also heard this one as a round. So just keeping it the same and throwing out that last throw, catch. And it's a, it's a nice, simple round to start off with. That's great. I hadn't done it as a round yet. Mm-hmm. Okay, so for this last song, when we were gathering these songs to share with you, we tried to include different areas of Africa And this last one is from the northern region, Egypt, and it's called Aya Zain. For this one, I think it's important to keep in mind, I know we've talked about this before, Candice, minor doesn't always equal sad. Because this song, it is in a double harmonic scale, and it's a love song. So you wouldn't think if you were hearing it, or if you were taught major equals happy, that this is a love song. But it's a love song, so, and it's very beautiful. I think that's so important, like what Michael mentioned, just using our musical terms and calling it major minor rather than assigning it a feeling that might not necessarily match with what that song is trying to portray. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it sounds like this. Ayazain, Ayazain, Ayazain el That's beautiful, Louisa. That's a new song for me. Well, thanks for hanging out. Our next episode is going to wrap up this series about music from cultures around the world. Although we could really keep discussing this topic forever. Yes, it's never ending. I mean, think of how many cultures are around the world. So there's, yeah, exactly. There's so much great music to explore, but you and I have a growing list of topics to discuss. So stay tuned in, everyone. Thanks for listening to Tuneful Talk, and y'all have a great day. Resources gathered for this podcast can be found on our website. If you have any questions about what we discussed or a topic request for a future podcast, please send us a message through our website, tunefultalk.weebly.com.